Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org. Good morning, I'm Barbara Kay, here with Susan Pertnoy, and welcome, welcome to Mosaic, Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine show. Mosaic explores Jewish topics here in the Palm Beaches and around the world. You may know a bit about Israel's being a global leader in technology and innovation, but what you'll learn today from New York Times bestselling author Seth Siegel about how Israel is changing the world will truly take your understanding of the matter to a new level. Get ready for an astonishing interview with Seth Siegel right after this. Please consider supporting Mosaic's generous sponsors at Bruce Gendelman Insurance Services. Visit Gendelman.com today for your expert consultation. Our lives are made of memories, but when those memories start to fade, your happiness shouldn't follow. At Morse Life's Memory Care Residences, your loved one is safe and secure with the very best care from our staff who are specially trained to work with memory loss. The greatest luxury of all is the peace of mind that awaits at the gold standard memory care residences at Morse Life. Find the life you love again. Secure your lease today. The Memory Care Residences at Morse Life. Jewish Federation is rolling out the red carpet for you on March 8th for One Night, a celebration of impact. Featured speaker Mark Platt is an award-winning theater, film, and TV producer whose projects include Wicked, La La Land, and many other modern-day classics. One Night is taking place at the Palm Beach County Convention Center and features special receptions for Jewish Professionals Network and major donors to Federation. Learn more and RSVP now at jewishpalmbeach.org slash one night. We're here with Seth Siegel, New York Times bestselling author of Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution to a Water-Starved World. Welcome to Mosaic, Seth. A pleasure to be here. Why have you dedicated your life to water issues in Israel and around the globe? Well, I discovered about five or six years ago that we're going into a period of global water scarcity. We haven't felt it the full brunt of it yet, but it's a coming, it's accelerating, and it's, um, and it's already starting to cause mayhem, and the mayhem is going to get much worse. We think mostly in political terms of wars and so forth, but the environmental issues are starting to really affect people all around the world, and somewhat in the United States as well. And, we're, and when I discovered that Israel had the answer to nearly every one of the scarcity issues that was beginning to affect the world, I thought it was my, say, duty to share with as many people as possible that we, yes, we're going into a very harsh time, but we need not despair because there are solutions at hand. <clears throat> Let's talk about some of that. Um, first of all, in Israel, the leaders had such forethought in a, when the country was first formed yes. to focus on water. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, most people when they think about Israel, particularly in the early years, they generally think of one or maybe two areas that they thought the leaders focused on. Of course, the military, <clears throat> and they did do a lot in the pre-state years, in the early years of the state. They built out a great military capability to defend the state against both armies and terror attacks. Many people know Israel's early story, also know that the leaders focused a lot in the early years, particularly in the pre-state years, on immigration absorption. They wanted to have a fantastic system of migrant absorption because they knew that if things worked out the way they hoped they would, that large numbers of Jews would come in from all over the world to the newly formed state of Israel. But what is much less well known, but it permeates their thinking, their diaries, their internal dialogues, is in the early days, starting in the 1930s, uh, 10, 12 years before the state gets declared, um, the leaders are already talking about how they have to build up a water, uh, a water in insight, they have to be smart about water, they have to be ahead of the curve about water, because the region is water scarce, 
and they need to be able to have all the water they'll need to be able to absorb and attract people from all over the world who want to settle in Israel and want to be able to keep them in Israel with a dynamic economy and a great agriculture. And Israel is two-thirds desert, so they really focused on uh, accomplishing this. Can you talk about some of what they've done? Yeah, well, by the way, the fact that Israel's two-thirds desert is fascinating. You know, Israel is the only country in the world that ended the 20th century with less desert land than it started the century. Now, if you consider that Israel wasn't founded until 1948, it makes it even more remarkable. And, and the, the, the scientists call that process of growing deserts desertification. It's a very big problem. It predates the climate change problem. And it creates poverty. It creates migration. It's a very serious global problem for, you know, not in lush places like here, South Florida, but in other parts of the world. And yet, they developed a form of, of brilliance around desert farming. They realized that if they could put the right ingredients together, the desert could be actually a robust and wonderful place to grow fruits and vegetables. And today, I mean, if, if any of your viewers go to Israel, they should take a trip down south of no more than an hour or two from where they normally would stop their journey, and they'll see thousands and thousands of acres of, of uh, fruits and vegetables being grown in hothouses using water that is, has no other value because it's brackish water, it's very salty water, being grown on specially bred seeds, gen not genetically modified, regular breeding, that thrives on salty water, and that is able to grow in desert sands that have no nutrition in the soil at all. It's a really, it's a, it's, it's a marvelous transformation. So what, what, what do they do? The, the stems are not as, as long, so you don't need that depth of soil? Well, it's a number of technologies coming together. First of all is the great technology of breeding seeds that um, can thrive on salty water. And for those, again, of your viewers who have ever been to Israel or had Israeli fruits or vegetables here in America, you know that the Israeli vegetables in particular are very sweet. Right. And the reason for that is when it's grown on salty water, the plant wicks away the salt by creating glucose, sugar. The salt gets pushed out, the glucose remains. That's the first technology, is bread seeds. The second great technology is something called drip irrigation. In most of the world, you flood the field or you sprinkle the field. Israel invents in the late 1950s, early 1960s, something called drip irrigation, where tiny, tiny drippers drip droplets of water at the roots of the plant at regular intervals. No water is lost to evaporation. No water is lost. So you're able to combine these technologies plus the will and the insight of farmers prepared to you know, be pioneers Invest. in the land and to create these great desert farms. And the best thing of all about this desert farming is you need no pesticides because pests can't thrive in the desert. Oh, I, I never realized and that. And the drip irrigation is modified and they put into the drippers tiny amounts of liquefied nutrients so that it's like it's being in the soil being fed nutrients that's the job of the soil. In sand, it's barren, it's sterile. But here, in this case, it's not barren or sterile because all the sand's job is to do is to anchor the seed. And they start dripping little droplets of water plus nutrients, and they grow, and they grow very dynamically. That's, that technology is just brilliant. And it's pretty Israeli. Good. Right. Pretty good. That's right. <laughs> Um, and tell us how they harvest the water there. Well, Israel has an all-of-the-above strategy. They don't just do one thing, they do many things. And I regard that as, some, to some extent, one of the great um, traits of Israel. They don't look for a silver bullet to solve all their problems. I think, uh, I'm an American, I'm not an Israeli, but I think one of the things about Americans, because we're big and we're rich, and we think, okay, we'll come up with the solution. In Israel, it's lots of solutions. So they use smart agricultural policies because agriculture eats up most of your fresh water. Israel leads the world by far, by far, in taking sewage, treating it to an ultra-high pure level, but not reusing it for drinking water because they know psychologically people won't want to do that. Even though it probably... It's clean enough to drink. Right. You can drink it, no problem. But they say people won't want to do that. Psychologically, there's a, there's, a, there's a yuck factor. So what they did was they spent 30 years and billions of dollars with some support by the Jewish National Fund also, building out a parallel national water infrastructure system where they take the sewage from all the cities, clean it to an ultra pure level, and then ship it to farms all over the country where the water is used to grow fruits and vegetables, pure, healthy, safe the way of doing so. That's remarkable. And hold that thought because we must, must take a break. We'll be right back with our program after this brief message. Coming up, 
more from our interview with New York Times best-selling author Seth Siegel. Please consider supporting Mosaic sponsors at Lesser Lesser Landy and Smith. Visit lesserlawfirm.com to learn more. The all-new Brayman Porsche, a world-class experience. Club Brayman is amazing. World-class dedication. It's the most exciting thing. I recommend it to anybody. I don't care what your skill level is. World-class excitement. I think it's a great brand. These cars are designed to go this fast. World-class performance. They took me out to the track to uh, race the car. Anyone that wants to get a Porsche, Brayman is the place to go. The all-new Brayman Porsche, a world-class experience. We're here with Seth Siegel talking about water and how the innovations are remarkable in, in Israel. And I want to talk to you about drinking water. How, how have the Israelis dealt with that issue? Well, they've done, as I said uh, before our break, I mentioned that Israel has an all the, all the above strategy. And they do the same thing with drinking water. For many years, not currently because there's a bad drought going on, Israel would extract some water from the Sea of Galilee. They would extract some water from, the, uh, from some rivers that feed the Sea of Galilee. They would extract some water from the aquifers along the coast. But what's great about this is they have a balanced, integrated system. So whatever is in need can be allowed to rest. And whatever there's an abundance, that can be taken more out of. And when there's a shortage everywhere, because they have created the most remarkable mechanical means of creating water, Israel is a world leader in the, in the development of desalinated water. And going back to the 1950s, if you read the diaries of the first prime minister of Israel, his name was David Ben-Gurion, you know, Ben-Gurion Airport, that's the same David Ben-Gurion. And David Ben-Gurion writes in his diaries about how we can transform Israel and transform the world if we can only figure out a way to, his words, to desalt the sea. Now, desalting the sea becomes desalination. And he puts, at a time when there wasn't a lot of money available, he puts smart men and women, and he puts money behind the idea of experimenting with what was then thought of as science fiction. It's thought of as a crazy idea. You know, now, after the fact, well, of course right. it was going to succeed. I'll, I'll put my chip on that one right. now that the roulette right. wheel has finished, right? But at the time, people thought it was a crazy idea. I had the pleasure in writing the book of interviewing the man who been now a very, very, very old man, but he, I interviewed the man who was in charge of the program that Ben Gurion created. And he said, candidly, he says, I didn't think he meant it. He says, candidly, I thought that he just did it for fundraising purposes when, when rich <laughs> Jews came to visit Israel. <laughs> but in fact, Ben-Gurion totally meant it. And we know that because in his private diaries, he's talking about, with excitement, about this innovation and that innovation. Well, by 1964, Israel already has a working desalination plant. But the problem is that it's down in a lot in the southern tip of the country. And the problem is they can't figure out a way to make it work in a cost-effective way. It costs about, for about 300 gallons of water, they're spending about $14, which no one could afford that. So agriculture, household use, impossible. They keep tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. And I tell in my book about how President Lyndon Johnson learns about this, gets very excited about it, and he wants to partner with the Israelis. And they keep fixing it and changing and fixing and changing. Today, Israel has the world's largest, most energy efficient, and lowest cost per gallon water, desalinated water in the world. A huge plant in uh, Israel along the coast, which produces water at the equivalent of about 48 cents, those same 300 gallons. So it just shows how you focus on something, you work at it long enough, you put a little bit of smarts to it, and sometimes you get some really great results. And that was the case with desalinated water. So for Israel, not exactly, but the equivalent of 80%, if you could just segregate desalinated water for household use, right. the equivalent of 80% of Israel's household drinking water, shower water, sink water, is from desalinated sources. And it's not bad water, it's the opposite. It's the cleanest, freshest, healthiest water you could possibly imagine. Everything that's bad in water has been extracted by this great filtration system. And doesn't Israel also supply Gaza and the Palestinians with this water? And some neighbors as very well? Mu very much so, very much so. It's a story that doesn't get told very often, but that Israel's abundance is so extraordinary that not only does Israel have on-demand water, not only does Israel be, have the ability to be self-sufficient fruits and vegetables for itself and export billions and billions of dollars a year of other produce, but Israel provides the Palestinians in the West Bank with more than half of the water that they get. 
They provide, even during periods of conflict, when rockets are flying out of Gaza, every single day water is flowing into Gaza. And Israel, under treaty with the Kingdom of Jordan, has long provided Jordan with about 10% of its national water needs. And in recent years, for a whole variety of reasons, that number has gone up a bit. There are programs afoot to create a partnership between the Palestinians, the Israelis, and the Jordanians that it'll take a few years to build this out, but that ultimately one third of Jordan's capital, uh, Amman, will be receiving Israeli water supplies. Why do you think it's not spoken about? You know, I think, well, you're a media person. Maybe I should turn around the camera and interview you. I, I don't know. It seems to me that it's such a wonderful story. I've written a couple of op-eds for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about it, and I write about it at length in my book. It's a great story. It's a story of, of harmony. It's a story, of, you know, people say that will water be a source of wars of the 21st century, and I suppose that that's possible, but I actually am a more optimistic guy. I think that water could be a source of, of peace and reconciliation and cooperation and coexistence, and the reason why I believe that is because I see what Israel has done time and again around the world to educate people about how they could live their lives better around water. You also talk about hydro diplomacy in your book. Yes. Do you want to discuss that? Yeah, well, hydro diplomacy is, is simply the idea that uh, Israel, because it has so many antagonists, uh, largely because of the conflict and Islamic states have banded together against Israel, Israel has figured out that, that the world, and particularly the Islamic countries, are in such need of water that Israel can privately, without embarrassing anybody, develop extraordinary relationships with Islamic countries and Arab countries. And what about China? Well, to China second, but, 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 but can have a backdoor way in. And the example I, I love to give, and thank you for giving me the prompt, is China. In the 1970s, China honored the Arab boycott of Israel. They just looked at the numbers. You know, a lot of Islamic countries at the UN, they wanted their votes. But amazingly, by the late 1970s, their water problem grows so severe that they say, we need to have access to Israeli technology. And so they make a deal to have two teams of Israeli hydrologists come in secret into China. They come and they survey the land, sort of like uh, you know, what they do in the Bible. <laughs> and they discover that there are answers to Chinese water problems. The Chinese were so taken by that that they then proceed and declare to the Israelis that they're prepared to break their commitment to the Arab boycott of Israel and they will publicly ask Israel to send its leading water scientist to China, which they do. And within a year, that same scientist is on the stage in Beijing at the exchange of diplomats of the opening of diplomatic relations between China and Israel. That story, by That's the way, That's a Susan, remarkable story. Susan, that story, though, is not just a story from the 80s. That story is as recent as this very year. In 2017, four African nations Four African nations established diplomatic relations with Israel, countries that did not previously have diplomatic relations. And a key driver of that is the fact that they have severe water problems and they want smart access to Israeli water technology and Israel's active support. More of that is going to happen. The world's water problems is growing worse and Israel is going to be more and more mainstreamed as a result. Absolutely hold that thought. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, more from our interview with New York Times best-selling author, Seth Siegel. Don't miss the Mandel JCC's 28th annual Palm Beach Film Festival, happening now through February 11th. The renowned festival features a variety of powerful, entertaining films on Jewish issues and culture. Films are playing at theaters across Palm Beach County. See the full schedule and buy your tickets now at palmbeachjewishfilm.org. Please consider supporting Mosaic's generous sponsors at Bruce Gendelman Insurance Services. Visit gendelman.com today for your expert consultation. Our lives are made of memories. But when those memories start to fade, your happiness shouldn't follow. At Morse Life's Memory Care Residences, your loved one is safe and secure with the very best care from our staff who are specially trained to work with memory loss. The greatest luxury of all is the peace of mind that awaits at the gold standard memory care residences at Morse Life. Find the life you love again. Secure your lease today. The Memory Care Residences at Morse Life. We're back with Seth Siegel and discussing how water can help 
diplomatic relations with Israel around the world. Yes. We, you just were speaking about African nations and the need for, for a new water system and, and they've accepted Israel's technology and, and help. Do you want to elaborate a little more on that? Well, it's happening all over the world. We, we really are going to a period of global water scarcity. We have several phenomena happening at once. It's kind of like, to use an old phrase, a perfect storm. You have less rainfall because of climate change, or if you don't have less rain, if you have the same amount of rain, the intervals are longer now. And when the rain falls, it falls harder. And falls harder, which means the water is not being absorbed by the soil. And about two-thirds of the world's water supply is groundwater. But that means that the water has to come and dribble into the soil. When it hits and doesn't able to be absorbed, it's like it's never rained at all. So you have less groundwater being absorbed. At the same time that you have more people than ever, we're about 7 billion people in the world today. We're rising to between 10 and 11 billion people by mid-century. But we don't have to wait till mid-century. Right now, right now, the whole world is growing more affluent. Over a billion people, 1.3 billion people who currently live in dire poverty will be rising out of poverty this very year and the next few years ahead. And these people's diet will change and use of electricity will change and suddenly they're gonna need a lot more water, not for a jacuzzi or a swimming pool, though there may be some of that, but just because of the fact that producing food for middle class lifestyle is much more water intensive. I'll give you a statistic. Okay. It takes 17 times more water to raise a pound of beef than to grow a pound of corn. Now some of your viewers may be vegetarians or vegans, but nobody, I'm gonna guess, who's a viewer of yours is a vegetarian or vegan for other than moral or ethical or health or religious reasons. It's not because they can't afford it. So around the world you have lots of people who suddenly are eating corn or rice or wheat seven days a week, and over the next few years they're gonna start having chicken and beef. None of your viewers will be watching eating pork, but some people <laughs> will be, and, some, and therefore it will be changing the world's food profile. Now, we need to have a lot of extra water, but the perfect storm doesn't stop there. You have badly broken infrastructure around the world. We're losing, on the U.S., about 35% of our water to leaks, but in some countries around the world, like Indonesia, 65% of the water is lost to leaks. Israel, by the way, is under 10%. So, so, that, so that what we have is we have this, and we have lots of polluted water. Industrial, industrial pollution of water means it's taken offline. So at the very moment that you have more need for water, you have less water available than ever before. And that is going to create a fundamental shift in the same way that, say, in the 1970s, the oil shock led to a rise of power of the oil producing states, the OPEC countries. Now that we have energy independence in the United States, we see their power is receding. Right. In the same way that the world is going to ever greater water scarcity, I don't have to guess about this, I know this for a fact. In the past year, more than 6,000 water professionals, water government officials from countries around the world came to visit to find out what is it that Israel is doing. That's a large number of officials from cities, from states, from national, uh, national assemblies. They want to know what we can do and one of the arguments I make all the time is that when Israel shows how it can be a solution to the world's problems, when it is offering opportunities for many people around the world, people will forget about their old historical political grievances and figure out a way. Absolutely. Saudi Arabia is reportedly becoming very friendly with Israel, not because suddenly they, they love Israel, but suddenly they realize they have a very big threat from Iran. And so day by day, almost every day, you read in the newspaper some other very exciting development in Saudi-Israeli relations. That's going to happen with other Gulf countries in Israel and Egypt and Israel. You're going to see it. I have no doubt of it. That is going to open the door to Israel becoming a source of solutions, certainly in water, but also in, in technology and cybersecurity and other areas like that. Speaking of technology, our federation is having a community mission in June of 2018. And one of the tracks that a person can opt for is technology and, and, invent, and inventions. Why do you think it's so important for, for people to come, go and see what's going on in that regard? Well, you're talking to somebody who goes to Israel about as easily as I go to New Jersey. I live in Manhattan. So, so uh, you don't need to give me a lot of excuse to go to Israel. I think going to Israel is always a good idea. Um, if you can afford the trip, I would tell you it's a great way to inspire yourself. I've been to Israel dozens of times and I never tire of going. And every time I go, I come back feeling inspired 
by the innovation and the daily courage of the Israelis. And so just for that reason alone, I would encourage people to go. But Israel is breathtaking in, in, in the way that they, they, encourage, that they encourage kids from the youngest age to take risks and they come up with great ideas so that many of the ideas fail, but enough of them succeed and succeed wildly that they change the world. And so we are on an interesting moment in history. We have the opportunity, those of us who live safely and happily here in America, but those also us who care about Israel, we have the opportunity to see history being made almost every day. And so it's a very exciting thing to do. And if you're going on a technology tour, please somebody call me and I'll give you some ideas for what you should see in water as well. We definitely will, and I really thank you for joining us. This has been extraordinarily enlightening, and I didn't even have time. Do I have time for one more question? I, I'm going Just to ask you. hold the book up. I'm going to hold the book up, but one more question. What can we do as Americans here to, on a personal note, to help with the water situation? Well, there's a lot that we can do, but I would argue that the single most important thing we can do is to help educate our elected officials. One of the things that, one of the key reasons I wrote the book was because um, I have a friendly relations with quite a number of elected officials, and I was, I was, I wouldn't say shocked, but I was concerned that when I was working on the book, so many of them went, who know me and know me as a friend would say, well, what are you working on? Water, why is that a problem? I turn on the faucet, the water's there. And I think that, that I don't say everyone has to read my book, but, but you get a feel for what the topic is. Water is not just a problem that's over there. It's not just the, if you're an insomniac, those middle of the night public service announcements of kids you know, uh, in, in Africa and Asia schlepping water from here to there. This is a problem that's affecting us in America now. And we have to educate our public officials to care about water issues because it takes between 10 and 20 years to properly build out the water systems that we need. We know the roadmap, the Israelis have provided it, but we have to get going too because real catastrophe could come. Now, yep. if I have time for one more word, we have to fix the problem not just for ourselves, but so that we don't see a humanitarian crisis around the world. That will affect us badly as well. And that is also on our shoulders as the world leading country for us to educate countries around the world what they have to do. Citizens have to get smart about the issue to educate their elected officials because there are solutions at hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Take care. Coming up, what's happening in your community? Want to see Israeli fashion icon Sharon Tal speak in person? Join me and other dedicated women in the community at Celebrating Women. This is Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's flagship event for women in our community. Celebrating Women is on Monday, January 29th at 11.30 a.m. at the Hilton West Palm Beach. Interested? Learn more and RSVP today at jewishpalmbeach.org slash celebrating women. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters, 